Hey everyone, this is Frito Lagarage Rave and I'm here with my recap and review of The Gilded Age season number 2, episode number 8, which is titled In Terms of Winning and Losing, and this particular episode serves as the season 2 finale, and a lot happens. A lot happens in this finale, a lot a lot of things change, and I really, really hope that this show comes back for season 3, and it could be the final season, I don't care, but, I mean, I do care, but in a sense that... I don't want this show to just end on a cliffhanger. I, if uh, if if it's to return and HBO decide to cancel it, I want HBO to give it like one final season, right? Make it like an extended season or something, maybe 10 episodes and just close the story. But yeah, coming back to the episode, it basically opens up with Bertha reading a letter and being all angry because it's a letter from the Duke. And yeah, Mrs. Astor ended up basically buying the Duke away from Bertha. And George is like, you know what? We knew that this was going to happen, right? She probably offered him a lot, a lot of money. And Bertha's like, but we can offer him money too. And George is like, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to play such a game. And especially because, and why the heck do you even need a duke? He's like a weak man and everything. He's greedy. We don't need him. And Bertha's like, George, you don't understand. And but you don't understand. I ha I need him because if he doesn't show up at the Met, no one else is going to show up. Everyone is going to side with Aster and uh, Miss Aster and Academy. And George is like, you know what, Bertha? Have more faith in yourself. Uh, your uh, your entire opening thing with the Met is going to be amazing, whether or not the Duke is there. And Bertha's like, yeah, you say so, but I I don't know, George. Uh, I, I need to think of something. And George is like, you know what? When you talk like that, you make me quite nervous and all of that stuff. Now, I really... Like, one of the things I really enjoyed of, uh, when it comes to this season is the relationship between George and Bertha and how supportive both of them are together. And again, George is supportive of Bertha. He wants to support her uh, in everything she does. But when it, when it comes down to it, George, because he's the one making money and he controls the money, I like the fact that he kind of put his foot down. He was like, Bertha, no, we are not going to go into this buying the Duke game with uh, Mrs. Uh, Astor. It doesn't make sense. And then Bertha ended up doing something at the end of this particular episode, which I guess if the season comes back for a season number three that's gonna cause conflict between George and Bertha which I'm here for because season two had Bertha be angry with George because of the Turner thing and I think that season three is gonna be George being angry at Bertha because of what she does but we'll get to it in a bit we cut to the Van Ryans to uh, kind of understand what kind of financial uh, trouble Agnes is in because of uh, the scam that uh, Oscar ended up falling for. And of course, Agnes is still angry of Oscar and all of that. And then Mr. Harcourt, some sort of lawyer, comes in and he basically tells Agnes, that, hey, I ended up going over your financials and the estate and all of that stuff. So if you end up selling this house and, and because of the little money you have, and if you end up investing it properly, you will be able to have some sort of living income and vote it won't be grand but at least you won't be on the street so let me know what you want to do and Agnes is like okay so this is going to be a very very big change for all of us so we'll get back to you after I've thought about it we got to the Russell's house and basically the guy who's in charge of the Met is uh, congratulating Bertha and all of the work she's done to support the Met and get people there and all of that and then we have a scene where Aurora ends up meeting this guy that's with Gladys and Aurora's like okay so who are you are you one of Gladys's suitors and he's like well I like to be and Gladys is like oh don't be silly you're not my suitor you're my friend and I'm like wow wow she basically friend zoned him right in front of his uh, right in front of someone else and I'm like you know what it makes sense because Gladys is not interested in him and she she likes him she likes having him around as a friend but there's no romantic spark and I like the fact that Gladys is very open about it even if this guy isn't really accepting that fact and then the guy who's in charge of the Met, he ends up telling Bertha that just so you know, Mrs. Russell, I ended up spreading the rumor that the Duke is going to be at the Met. And Bertha's like, why the heck would you, why the heck would you do that? What if the Duke doesn't come? And the guy is like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. I know that the Duke will come. And if he doesn't come, and if you think that there are certain doubts when it comes to him basically arriving at the Met, I know you can handle it. And I'm like, wow, wow, he really put Bertha in a, in a difficult place, huh? We also have this little scene where Bertha appreciates Aurora showing up, but she's also like, so you will be coming to the Met, right? And Aurora's like, you know what, Mrs. Russell, I'm not really a brave person. And Bertha's like, why? What are you afraid of? And Aurora's like, basically Mrs. Astor.
Of course, Agnes has to tell the staff that things are going to change and a whole bunch of them are going to be out of jobs. So be ready and they can stay in the house as long as uh, until it's sold. However, they should start like finding a job and applying right now. And if they do get a job, they should take it. There's another meeting that's being held uh, concerning the closing of the school meant for children of color and all of that stuff. So Peggy and her mom like come to the meeting and this is where the, uh, this woman with the child passes Peggy by and we find out that that woman and the child are basically Mr. Fortune's wife and child and ooh yeah Peggy Peggy needs to get away from Mr. Fortune as soon as possible. The staff is going uh, through uh, job applications uh, in the newspaper and Bannister is like, you know what, uh, the cook uh, the cook will be okay because Agnes needs someone to cook the food for her. But uh, the, the person that's clearly going to be let go of is Mrs. Armstrong. And of course, Mrs. Armstrong is like, you know what, my life is basically over. I'm not young enough to be a ladies maid anymore and this is it. I'll be on out on the streets and all of that stuff. And while all of them are talking, this is where Jack kind of gets up and goes into the kitchen and uh, Adelaide, I think her name is Adelaide. I can never remember her name. But anyway, the girl follows her and she's like, okay, Jack, so what's up? And Jack tells her that uh, he ended up hearing back from the petitioner office and they approved his petition. And she's like, why aren't you telling the rest of the staff? And he's like, I don't wanna. And then she's the one who ends up breaking the news and everyone is happy. Uh, of course, Mrs. Armstrong isn't happy, but yeah, everyone is happy. And now like, and they're like, okay, so now what are you, what you're gonna do? And Jack is like, you know what? I haven't thought about it. I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to do now. We cut to the Russell's house, it's raining, and we see Mrs. Bruce and the cook running and coming back into the kitchen. So apparently they went out to listen to a concert, but then it started raining, and they tried to, like, keep on listening to it, but it was too much, so they had to come back. And you know what, as far as, as a couple goes, I'm, I'm okay with these two. Peggy had the idea that, that that Jack should go and talk to Larry about what he needs to do next after he gets the petition. And Larry's like, you know what, I'm not a clockmaker, so I'm not really sure what you just created. But it looks very, very interesting because, again, the considering that you ended up making a clock that doesn't need oil, this clock can end up being used in every bedroom across New York. So this is something big. But still, I don't know how to help you, but I can ask the right people and I'll get back to you, Jack. Jack ends up going back because he needs to uh, be ready for supper and all of that stuff. And Miriam is left behind with Larry and these two get to talking. And this is where Larry basically tells Miriam that, uh, you know what? Uh, I've, uh, no, my bad, my bad. Yeah, Miriam ends up telling Larry that the, uh, the, uh, the fact, beh uh, the reason behind the Duke not showing up for the Met is that... Uh, uh, even though Mrs. Alistair ended up uh, buying him, the persuasion stuff, that came, came from Mr. McAllister. And Larry's like, really? Mr. McAllister? And Miriam's like, yeah, that's what I heard. And I'm like, yeah, Miriam stirred that pot, girl. But anyway, Larry's like, uh, you know what? Would you be so kind enough to join me? Uh, at the Mets opening and uh, Miriam is like I'm not really sure because Aunt Agnes is on the other side and and I'm not really brave enough to face Aunt Agnes and Larry is like you'll be surprised Miriam so please please accept the offer. It's dinner time and Miriam basically tells Agnes that she's been invited to the Met to attend the Met and Agnes is like I who invited you? I hope it's not uh, the Russell boy. And Miriam is like, no, she basically lies. She's like, no, it's uh, it was Mrs. Russell who invited me. And Agnes is like, of course that woman would invite you, just to spite me. And again, enemy lines are being drawn. If you end up going to the Met, you would be against the Academy. And Miriam is like, but I don't even know what the Academy is. I'm not linked to it. I don't even know the people who are who are in support of it. And Agnes is like, those are old friends, Miriam. And when it comes to us, the people of society, old friends come with the family stuff hereditary and 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 of course ada basically tries to side with Miriam, and Miriam basically tells agnes hey i'm gonna go okay and oscar is like uh, do i need to go and he's like yes yes of course Bertha asks Bruce about uh, Mrs. Bruce about uh, all of the preparations and if everything is ready and all of that stuff. And Bruce says, like, "Yeah, yeah, everything is ready." And also, she ends up asking uh, what song they'll be listening to when it comes to the Met opening. And Bertha tells her. And then this is where Bertha's like, uh, you, "Do you enjoy music, Mrs. Bruce?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, I do." Uh, I, I do. And Bertha ends up doing something very, very kind for her uh, as, this, as the episode continues. After Peggy is done helping Agnes with her correspondence and letters and all of that stuff, this is where Agnes is like, you know what, things are going to change. And we're going to, uh, I guess, 
be we'll we'll miss you uh mrs scott uh mrs scott and she uh, Miss uh, peggy is like it doesn't matter but anyway i am worried f uh for the staff for the staff because i'll be okay it doesn't matter i'm a writer and all of that stuff but yeah the staff is really worried especially mrs armstrong because again she's old and she doesn't have a lot of options left for her and then after saying that peggy leaves and ada is like why would uh, why would peggy end up having uh such sympathy for for someone like mrs uh Mrs. Armstrong after everything she said about her and Agnes is like you know what when it, when it comes to what kind of woman uh, Armstrong is it kind of makes sense that Peggy would pity her after Larry ends up telling Bertha about Al uh, Alistair being the one who ended up convincing the Duke to side with Lena, of course, Bertha invites him over to talk and she's like, you know what? I wasn't expecting this, uh, Mr. McAllister, especially from you. I thought we were friends and Mr. McAllister is like, hey, I'm gonna be very, very clear about this. I am your friend, but I'm also Lena Astor's friend. And when it comes to society, that's the friend that I'm known for. I'm known in society as uh, Aster's friend. And Bertha's like, okay, so what the heck did she offer? Did she offer the Duke a lot of money? And Alistair's like, yeah, she offered him a lot of money, but she also offered him something else. She's opening America for the Duke. And again, he's like, you know what? I've been in this game for a very, very long time, Mrs. Russell. So just accept defeat. Uh, the the Duke is going to show up at the academies uh, at the academy, and it would be better if you show up there too because you have a box and support Mrs. Uh, Astor. And Bertha's like, mm hmm, mm hmm. We'll see about that. Again, it's basically the conversation that I talked about during the beginning of this video, and I think that's when the conversation happened. But yeah, it's the same conversation about Bertha wanting to outbid Astor, and George is like, no, Bertha, no, we are not doing that. We. We are not. We are not going to be basically giving away money to a greedy man. Armstrong is helping Agnes pack and all of that stuff. And Agnes like, I have a lot of stuff and some of the stuff I won't be even using. So what the heck am I supposed to do? I, I highly doubt that the new house that we'll be moving in even will, will even have an attic. And then she talks about how Armstrong and her have seen a lot of obstacles, a whole lot of ups and downs, and they have always survived. And then she makes an offer to Armstrong about staying with her. She won't, she can't promise the, a lot of money and all of that stuff. She doesn't even know where, they, where they'll be moving, but Armstrong is welcome to try. And Armstrong says, thank you, thank you, ma'am. And she's like, what made you change your mind? And this is where Agnes, tell, Agnes tells her, well, it's it's something, it's because of something that Miss Scott said. And Agnes is like, uh, and yeah, Armstrong is like, why would she have certain words, uh, like kind words to say about me? And Agnes is like, don't you, don't you feel nice? That someone like Miss Scott has still has something nice to say about you, even after how you basically uh, treated her. We cut to the pharmacy, and the guy is talking to uh, Peggy's father about a new uh, thing, a new thing in the market about how, uh, uh, it's some sort of chemical name I forgot, but apparently they got rid of the bitterness. And he's like, "Hey, this is a sample bottle. Try it out." And as these two are talking, this is where he ends up telling uh, Peggy's father that, "Hey, you know that meeting that's supposed to happen in order to uh, have you guys present." facts to keep the schools open well that meeting got changed did you do you it's actually happening today instead of tomorrow don't you know about it and Peggy's dad is like no no I don't and of course he ends up rushing back home to tell everyone the people are still trying to get uh, to go over the facts in order to make their argument as uh, valid as possible. But no, they don't have time. They have to go. They have to basically barge into the meeting room, and uh, yeah, they they just have to go. And it really and again, this, a lot happened. Again, we'll get to the Met and Academy thing, but this. The way that the writers handle this particular situation, especially because it's like very, very, it's based on real life. I like that. And I like the fact that uh, the Gilded Age, similar to how they handled such storyline in season number one, they continued showing what the black community was going through during that time in season number two. And hopefully we'll get to learn more about what the black community experienced in season number three. Yeah, they barge in and they're like, why the heck did you not tell us about the meeting time changing? And the guy who's basically leading the meeting, he's like, well, we didn't tell you because we had other stuff to talk about too. And of course, uh, Peggy and the rest of the group aren't having it. And they're like, no, we are here to make our arguments. A whole lot of students have enrolled. And because a lot of students want enrolling and a lot of teachers are willing to basically teach these students, you can't close our three schools. 
Dershel finally appears because he's been keeping his distance, especially after everything that Ida, Ida and Agnes went through. But now he's back. He's happy to see Miriam. And he's like, you know what? I'm very, very excited about the wedding. And will you go on teaching? And Miriam is like, well, I would like to. And Dershel is like, no, why would you? I want you to give you a life of luxury and comfort so you won't be teaching. And I'm like, ooh, ooh, that's not going to work for Miriam. And then we have these conversations about Luke dying and how there's a lot of paperwork that Ada needs to go through. And Dershel's like, like, well, if you ask me, you should go through it as quickly as possible, get it done with. And then the conversation shifts to Miriam's wedding. And this is where Dershia is like, you know what, Aunt a Agnes, uh, because of everything you're going through, please allow me to uh, pay for the wedding. And of course, everyone is happy for that. And he's like, yeah, I, I would be happy to pay for Harriet's wedding. And I'm like, oh, no, not Harriet. And of course, the aunts notice that. Miriam notices that too. And this is where Agnes jumps in and she's like, you know what, it is my dearest wish to see Marion happy. She kind of corrects Dershel and he's not even apologetic about it. And I'm like, you know what? Considering what Marion ended up telling Dershel as the episode continues and how Agnes reacted to it, it made sense because Agnes could see in this particular episode, uh, in this particular scene, Agnes could tell that, you know what? This wedding it's it's not going to work. It turns out that the group was able to basically kind of get what they wanted. So apparently, instead of the three schools closing, only one school will close. And Peggy's like, why that? Why that? Why are they even closing a single school? And yeah, she's being told that, you know what? It has to happen so that the board doesn't look like, uh, doesn't look incompetent. But hey, we take our wins where we get them. And now that we know about the potential danger, we'll be more prepared and the fight will continue. We get this little scene between Peggy and Mr. Fortune and no, our girl is down bad for Mr. Fortune and I'm like, Peggy, get up. Stand up, Peggy, stand up. Things have become better for Peggy uh, when it comes to the relationship between Peggy and her parents and I'm happy for that. I want these three to be happy again. Especially because they, uh, because Peggy and her mom are very, very appreciative of what uh, her dad was able to do. Dershel takes his leave and of course Agnes is excited about a wedding, but Ada stays back and she's like, okay, Miriam, so what's up? Are you not feeling okay? And Miriam's like, no, I have a lot to think about and Ada understands. Peggy's parent end up sharing a very, very touching moment, which shows that yes, the relationship is slowly being mended. And we get this quick scene of Miriam just sitting in a chair, looking at the fireplace. She's deep in thought. And of course, she's thinking about Dershel and how he's treating her and what that will mean if she ends up being his wife. Dershel comes over to pick Miriam up for school. And this is where Miriam is like, Dershel, I need you to sit down. There's something I have to talk about. And Dershel understands. He's like, oh, why do I have a feeling that it's not going to be good? And Miriam is like, well, it depends on how you take it. So she basically calls off the engagement. She's like, no, Dershel, uh, Dershel. I can't marry you. You're still in love with Harriet, your first wife. And Dershel's like, but there's nothing wrong when, oh, in in that, right? I can still love my first wife who died and all of that stuff. And Miriam's like, yeah, I understand that. I understand that. There, but there's a difference between loving someone that died and loving a new person and allowing that new person to take a new place in your life. But I'm not Harriet. You, it, it, you're treating me as if you want to replace Harriet with me. And that's not okay, especially not for me, uh, because I'm my own person. And there's a lot more good that I want to do. And Russia's like, what the heck am I supposed to tell my daughter? I mean, it's like, you know what? Just tell her the truth. She be, she'll be fine. And again, I'm doing this for all of us. I'm looking at the bigger picture. I want you to be happy, Dershel. I want you to find a woman who actually loves you and who actually wants to be with you. And yeah, Miriam taking a stand for herself, I really, really like that. Especially after what she went through in season number one, where the guy basically broke up with her and ghosted her and ended up being engaged to someone else and she didn't necessarily get closure or something. So I like the fact that she basically gave herself and Dershel closure. Dershel takes his leave and this is where Ada is like, okay, so what's up? And Miriam tells her the truth that I called off the, wed uh, called off the wedding there's no wedding uh, anymore. I broke up with him and all of that stuff. And again, I don't love him on Ada. And Ada's like, you know what? That was very clear from the beginning to me. But especially last night when he ended up basically calling you Harriet and all of that stuff. 
And Emilia's like, I want someone, I want to marry a guy who actually loves me like you and Luke. And Mary, and, and that really, really gets to Ada. She's very appreciative of the fact that when it comes to love and marrying, she is basically, Miriam is using Ada and Luke as a bar to compare herself to. And, and Ada likes that. We have this very, very funny little scene with Mrs. Fish and she comes over to Lena and she's like, okay, Lena, what's up? What's the tea? Where the heck is the Duke coming? Because uh, two of the publications are saying that he's going to show up at the Met, but two other publications are saying that he's going to show up at the Academy. So what's up? Where do I need to be? And Lena is like, you know what, Mrs. Fish, you don't have to worry about nothing. Of course, the Duke is going to show up at the Academy and I want you to show up the cad uh, at the Academy too. And yeah, Mrs. Fish is here for the tea and other people realize that and they still keep her around and she, they accept her for who she is. And I really, really love that. Oh, also, I forgot during the conversation that Bertha and Russell had, Russell was like, you know what you need to do, uh, Bertha? You have to make the people believe that the Duke is going to show up at the Met. Even if it ends up being a lie, you have to make them believe. And that's what Bertha ended up, I guess, doing. Basically, st like, stroking the flame. And that's why even the news is kind of confused. They're like, we don't necessarily know where the Duke is going to show up. And knowing Bertha, she doesn't, like, step away from a fight. So she decides to pay Duke an actual visit in person. And Duke is like, how the heck did you know that I was here? And Bertha's like, well, it's my job to know where you are, right? And the Duke apologizes to her. He, uh, she, he's like, I do apologize for behaving very, very badly. But you have to understand, I need the money. So apparently it turns out that the Duke is running out of money over in Britain uh, or wherever he's from. And then uh, and he's like, I've got people to take care of. I've got estates to take care of of and I need the money and Lena Astor is giving me that money and Bertha's like I understand that I understand that but you'll be needing money for decades right for generations and I have an offer for you and this is where I'm like oh no 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 she's gonna she's gonna offer Gladys to the Duke and that's like wrong that's wrong in at so in so, so many levels and George isn't gonna be a fan of that at that when he realizes that what Bertha has planned now I was expecting this scene I wasn't expecting the show to basically have a scene between Miriam and Francis. I really thought that Francis was going to leave school or something, but no, she's still in Miriam's class. And she basically, after class, she walks up to Miriam and she's like, okay, so why the heck aren't you marrying my father? What happened? And this is where Miriam, she treats Francis as an adult. And she has kind of a mature conversation with Francis about two adults falling in love and wanting to marry and all of that stuff. And she's like, I do love you, Francis, and I do love your father, but I don't love your father in a way that a woman should if she wants to marry that uh, particular per, uh, uh, person. And Francis is like, so what does that mean? That you won't be part of our lives anymore? We won't get to meet outside of school? And we're just like, no, 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 that's not it. I'll, I'm very, very interested in you and I want to be part of your life. I want to dance. Uh, I want to dance at your wedding and all of that stuff but hey what I did is because I love you and your dad and you might not understand this right now but you will with time and that kind of helps Francis calm down and kind of kind of understand uh, the situation and she's happy about it and I'm like you know what that's good that was a very very kind thing for Marion to do and I like the fact that the writers didn't add in unnecessary drama between these two. The opening for the Met is coming closer and Gladys is help, uh, and uh, uh, Berta is helping Gladys like get ready and all of that stuff. And this is where she, uh, Gladys is like, okay, mom, so can I invite Billy over to dinner after the Met opening? And also, can I invite him to sit with us in our box? And Gladys, uh, Gladys uh, Berta is like, no, that ain't happening. No, because again, she is planning to hook up Gladys with the Duke. And this is where Bertha ends up doing something very, very kind for Mrs. Bruce. And she's like, you know what? I just heard back from the organizer of the Met. The two tickets were returned. They're orchestra seats, but they're yours if you want them. And of course, uh, Mrs. Bruce is very, very happy about it. And she's like, uh, can I ask the cook to come with me? And Bertha's like, you know what? You have, you'll have, you have to ask church. And if he, if he says yes, then yeah, sure. Both of you can go. Now it's time for Peggy to put her foot down and basically end things with Mr. Fortune. And she kind of uh, hinted at that when she was talking to her mom after the board meeting. And she's like, you know what, mom, I understand what I have to do. And her mom is like, is that going to make you happy? And Peggy is like, well, it's not going to make me happy, but it's going to make you happy. And it's the right thing to do. And so the right thing was that Peggy is like, you know what, Mr. Fortune, we can't continue like this. I'm leaving your publication. And Fortune is like, why would you? You're just, uh, people like like reading what you write and you're you're basically creating a fan base don't leave now and Peggy's like no I have to leave now because again there's this thing between us 
which I don't want to continue and it's dangerous and yeah, the only option is for me to leave. And also I'm, I've been working on this novel that I want to continue working on. And I'm like, you know what? She's a writer. She'll probably end up finding another place to do her writing from. And again, I'm really, really glad that Peggy saw sense and she was like, nope, nope. I need to stay away from Mr. Fortune because Mr. Fortune wasn't really doing things to basically convince Peggy that whatever that the strange thing that's between them that that's not going to go anywhere he was still continuing to kind of flirt with Peggy and I didn't appreciate that so Peggy saw sense and she was like no I'm the one who needs to leave because Mr. Fortune isn't putting a stop to this it's time for Marianne and Agnes to attend uh, their uh, their <laughs> respective functions and she's like okay so are we to say good luck uh, are we to say good luck to each other I mean it's like I always wish you good luck on Agnes and then these two sit down and yeah because Agnes realizes that Marianne ended up breaking off uh, breaking the wedding and all of that stuff uh, the engagement and she basically sits Marianne down and she's like Mir uh, and uh, Marianne's like I know that you're angry with me Agnes and Agnes is like you know what Marianne I can't really be angry at you when it comes to like making or making you feel that you have to marry a, go a person Person who, a man who doesn't love you and especially because that night when he ended up saying Harriet instead of Marion e that Agnes wasn't happy about it either so she understands why Marion doesn't want to marry a guy like that but she also warns Marion she's like you know what time is fleeting time like uh, time goes by very very fast and this is a second strike against you Marion because the first strike was with that guy in season number one I've all rake Mr. Rake and strike two is with Dershal, and this was a strike that was very, very public. And she and she basically tells Marion that Marion, you can't afford another strike. And she basically warns Marion that this is bad girl, you need to you need to get a grip. It's time for Mrs. Bruce and the cook to leave and they end up welcoming the new woman who is now going to be working for Bertha and I'm like okay so where's Adelaide? Where is she? Shouldn't Adelaide be talking to Jack? Because it felt like the writers really dropped that particular storyline because Jack should be telling Adelaide about the patent and everything but I guess she disappeared somewhere. But anyway this woman is going to stick around and Mr. Watson is going to leave and everyone is happy for him and yeah I'm happy for him too. It's time for the Russells to leave and they also have to pick Marion along the way. And this is where Bertha comes down the stairs and George is like, oh, my darling, you look wonderful. Uh, and Bertha's like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not the one who needs to be uh, given the spotlight uh, tonight. It's going to be Gladys because she ended up making Gladys all beautiful and all pretty because, again, for the Duke. But Larry and George don't realize that. Gladys doesn't even realize that. Then we cut to the Alistairs and Lena and Lena's daughter. And they're like, hey, uh, the Duke is going to come to the Academy, right? And Alistair is like, yeah, right, to the Academy. And uh, Lena is like, of course. Why, why would you even doubt it? And while a whole lot of young people are at the Met opening, we cut to Oscar and Agnes. And Oscar is like, okay, so a lot of the skeletons and the ghouls are here. <laughs> because again, people from old society are going to continue supporting the Academy. Gladys, Larry, and Miriam talk about Bertha and how she manages stuff and how she basically gets what she wants and how they're, she's very, very certain that the Duke is going to show up. And Miriam is like, you know what? That makes sense. When it comes to Bertha, I guess that's how you need to be. If you want something, you have to get it. And I'm like, Miriam, are you, are you going to get the Duke r from right under Gladys? I hope not. <laughs> And we get this scene where it turns out that Turner got played because she thought that she got the center box. But no, it turns out that she got one of the boxes on, uh, on the side and she's not happy about it. And she's like, no, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to stay here. And her husband puts her, his foot down and he's like, no, you're going to sit down. You're going to you're gonna stay and you're going to play Bertha's game. We'll get to, uh, and Turner's like, okay, but I will never forget this. So basically, basically, uh, Turner's going to figure out something to get, uh, to get her revenge. And the fact that Turner didn't get the center box links to what George had uh, links to what George said to the organizer of the Met back in like two three episodes ago where he had the conversation with the guy in the train where he wanted the guy to give uh, Bertha and his family like the main the central box to hell I don't want to say it but yeah to hell with Turner <laughs> who cares but they want the center box and the guy came through and yeah but uh, the Russells had the center box and Turner is on to, uh, is off to the side and because it was a surprise for Bertha, because she didn't know that George had had a conversation with the guy, so she ends up being escorted to the center box. She's like, no, this isn't our box. And the guy, and the, and the usher is like, no, 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 ma'am, this is your box. So she walks into the center box and we get this very, very good looking scene where she's in the center and she's looking at her 
all her hard work, a whole lot of people are in the crowd and she's happy because again, the people believed that the Duke is gonna show up at the Academy opening. Aurora showed up and Berta's like, oh, I'm I'm surprised to see you here. And Aurora's like, well, uh, M Mrs. Astor can't have it all her own way, can she? We cut to the Academy and Mrs. Fish walks in and she's like, where the heck are the crowds? Why aren't a lot of people here? And Lena's like, don't worry. Those people just foolishly believe that the Duke is gonna show up at the Academy, uh, at, the, at the Met opening, but he's not. He's gonna come here. And Fish is like, are you, are you really sure? And, and, uh, and Lena's like, yeah, I am. And Fish is like, no, a lot of people are leaving. So tell me right now, is the Duke showing up or should I go back to the, or should I go to the opening uh, ceremony for the, uh, for the Met? And Lena is like, well, if you stay here, your loyalty will be appreciated, uh, right? And Mr. Mrs. Fish is like, nah, I ain't playing that game. I'm just going to leave because I don't like it here. Oscar tries to leave too. And I was like, no, sit down with me. And Lena is like, no, I can't believe it. I, I don't want to believe that Bertha won. And yeah, it turns out that the Duke did, does show up at the Met opening because of what Bertha ended up offering him. And I'm like, wow, wow. I'm just waiting for George to realize that in in the third season. So apparently Bertha got everything she wanted. She got the Duke and she also uh, gave Turner her payback. And George is like, uh, how the heck did that happen? And Bertha, uh, why did she lose her box at the Academy? And Bertha is like, well, I wrote to Mrs. Alice, uh, Astor, of course. And George is like, does she, does she know that the letter came from you? And Bertha's like, of course not. <laughs> And we have this conversation between uh, Agnes and Lena and McAllister where they basically talk about, yeah, things are changing. And McAllister tells the lady that, hey, it's said that everything has a season and it looks like the season of the Academy is coming to an end. Larry and Miriam continue talking uh, about the stuff that they're going through. And he's like, you know what, uh, Miriam, you should realize that you're a marvelous person, right? And I'm like, ooh, so this is happening, huh? A lot of fans want these two to be together, so I guess we'll get that in an upcoming season. Gladys notices Billy and she waves at him and she's like, mother, can I invite Billy over? And, Gra and Bert has like, no, babe, focus on the Duke for crying out loud. And again, Lena is very, very troubled. She's like, why would the Duke, uh, like, break his oath? He made an oath. And Alistair was like, well, I guess that's the type of person that the Duke is. And again, that's not the type of person you need, you want to have your daughter marry, right? He's greedy. He breaks oaths. He's not a man of his word. And that is bad. And George is like, how, how the heck did you even get him to come here? And Bertha's like, you know what, George, you're the one who makes money. And I don't, and I don't basically budge into your affairs. So when it comes to how things are handled in society, I would like you to leave me alone and let me do my own things. Don't interfere. And again, I'm like, George, you need to realize that you're your daughter is being presented as a sacrifice. Larry, it's the morning, so it turns out that the, uh, that the opera opening thing and the dinner, it, it went on for very, very late. It's like the sun's already up. And Larry walks Mary into her house, and this is where Larry is like, well, I am disappointed. Uh, I am sad to he hear about the Agnes situation and all of that stuff. Uh, will you will you be able to, like, be okay? And Mary's like, yeah, I, I can find a job and all of that stuff. And uh, Larry is like, but will you be moving? And Mary's like, uh, I will be moving, but I won't be going over from New York and Larry's like I'm glad to hear that and then he's also he also mentions Miriam not getting married and all of that stuff and he's like well I hope we remain friends Miriam I mean it's like Larry we know way too much about each other's personal lives to not ever be friends and I'm like Miriam you would be surprised because sometimes the best of friends make the worst of enemies but yeah these two end up sharing a kiss it finally happened so I think Miriam and Larry is gonna be a thing in season number three and it will be very very interesting to see what Bertha thinks of it. I think that Bertha likes Miriam. She likes having Miriam around, but I don't think she wants Larry to marry her, but let's see. Before leaving, uh, Larry ends up telling Jack that a lot of people were interested in his invention, and he basically offers Jack a partnership. He's like, uh, get into business with me, and you don't have to answer now. I'll come back with more detail. Miriam is very, very surprised that her aunts are still up. She's like, why the heck aren't you both sleeping? And Agnes is like, well, Ada wanted something to tell us. And she still, and that's why she refused to go to bed. And she's also refusing to let me go to bed. And this is where Ada is like, well, I went through all of the paperwork that Luke, Luke had and the lawyers wanted me to go through. So it turns out that Luke has a lot of money because his grandfather made it big in the textile industry and all of that stuff. And Luke didn't want nothing to do with all of that money when he ended up becoming a 
a priest and all of that stuff, but he didn't close the company because a lot of people were dependent on working there. But now that he's dead, his will says that he leaves the company to me. So yeah, uh, then when Ryan's now have a whole lot of money, which is like predictable, like the fans predicted that Luke was going to like give a lot of money to Ada. And that's exactly what happened. And yeah, everyone's happy. They're like, nothing will have to change. We don't have to sell a house. The staff can remain. And this is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful news. They call a banister to share the good news. And they're like, tell the rest of the staff that nothing's going to change. They can stay and everyone's happy. Now, before banister leaves, he basically stops and he addresses Ada and he's like, is that your wish, uh, madam, that you want to stay here and you don't want nothing to change and you want me to tell the staff members? And Ada is kind of confused, like, why the heck is Benister asking me that? Why isn't he asking Agnes? And Ada is like, yes, yes, that is my wish. And Anna is like, what the heck was that about? And Miriam catches up very quickly and she can't stop from smiling and she's like well it turns out that the banister realized that uh, miss ada now has the power because she's the one who's going to be paying all of them and she's the one who get who has all of the money <laughs> and i'm like ooh, the dynamic has changed between the sisters huh and a ada realizes that too and the way that cynthia nixon ended up like acting the scene out as the realization slowly like uh, dawned on her i'm like oh this is good she's already thinking about the changes that she's gonna make and she's like you know what agnes it doesn't matter if, even though things will change i i'm sure that we will manage and the episode ends with agnes basically looking at ada and she's like hmm really really you're really sure that we will be able to manage this and the episode ends and yeah i'm very very excited to see uh to you see episode, season number three and I hope that this show returns I want to continue I want to see how the writers explore the dynamic between the two sisters now that Ada is the one who has the money and also the Larry and Miriam thing and I'm on I'm interested in seeing what Peggy's gonna do next and yeah the Duke and the Gladys thing and I want George to realize that and of course he's gonna put a stop to Bertha's plan and that's gonna cause tension between them and that's gonna be interesting too. But yeah, that was it. I'll be, I think I'll try and share more of my thoughts in a written review. The link to the review will be down in the comment section as soon as the review goes up on the Geek Geary. Feel free to share your thoughts about this particular episode, the season as a whole. What do you think is gonna, what do you hope to see in season number three? Let me know. And until next time, stay happy, stay safe, stay blessed. See you guys later.